Good evening. I am over the top excited to see each and every one of you here. So just a, a very warm welcome. I'm just so pleased that so many of you joined us. I'm, I'm sure there were lots of other opportunities to do things tonight, and this just shows me of the interest level on the topic. Um, my name's Joan Thompson. I know I've talked to several of you on the phone. I hope you found it to this building okay since you're here. Um, let's all have a, a moment for all those people out there wandering, trying to find a parking spot. So anyway, you are at Making Peace with Food and Your Body. Just want to make sure you all know that you're in the right spot. Um, just to get an idea of who's here, um, can I have a show of hands of how many students there are? Woot woot! Yeah, so excited to see you. How about Cedar Falls and Waterloo folks? Aw oh, man, so good to see you too. How many are outside the Cedar Falls, Waterloo area? Yes, thank you for coming. Wow. Is there anybody from out of state? Ah, oh, thanks. Wow, that's great. I just uh, really want to warmly welcome you um, to our campus, and we're very glad you're here. Before I introduce our speaker, Evelyn Triboli, I just have a couple of things to share with you. Those of you here um, for personal wellness, there are sign-up sheets for credit. They will be outside the door. There will be one of our grad students there that can help na navigate that. So please know after the presentation, you can sign up for the credit. There is no paper handout to give you. However, if you go on our, our website, hopefully, I was hoping it would be on there today, but hopefully um, tomorrow. It's, uh, it's not necessary for the presentation, but it has a lot of wonderful studies and resources on it. Our website is just the um, www.uni.edu, and then backslash, backslash wellrec, and you will, it'll, you'll see it on the home page. There's also information about intuitive eating workshops. If you can't remember any of that, you all saw my name on literature, joan.thompson at uni.edu, email me, and I'll answer any of your questions. Also, University Book and Supply will be selling Evelyn's book, Intuitive Eating, um, out the doors to your left. Uh, so feel free to, if you're interested in buying a book, um, Evelyn did say she will sign some books uh, afterwards, and she's going to hang out here for however long you guys want to visit with her or until they kick us out. Uh, just a very warm thank you to generous sponsors. The Max and Helen Guernsey Foundation, Reaching for Higher Ground Food Matters Project, Wellness and Recreation Services, UNI Employee Wellness, and the Department of Residence and Panhellenic Council. This is being videotaped tonight, so if you, there's any of you who would like to see it again, um, just contact me and we can make those arrangements. So let me introduce Evelyn Triboli. She is an award-winning registered dietitian with a nutrition counseling practice in Newport Beach, California, specializing in eating disorders and intuitive eating. She also trains health professionals how to help their clients create a healthy relationship with food, body, and mind. She's written eight books, including Intuitive Eating, which she was a co-author. Evelyn was a nutrition expert for Good Morning America and was a national spokesperson for the American Dietetic Association for six years. She has appeared on hundreds of interviews, including CNN, Today Show, MSNBC, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, and People Magazine. She's the founder of Intuitive Eating Professionals on LinkedIn, which has nearly 700 members, I being one of them. Uh, just some fun facts. Uh, Evelyn qualified for the Olympic trials in the first year ever of the women's marathon in 1984. Although she no longer competes, she runs for fun, and she, enjoyed our wonderful Cedar Falls trails this morning, right along the river in Cedar Falls. So I am very 
more than honored, cannot even explain how honored I am to introduce to you Avalon Triboli. I will tell you, I have been working with the intuitive eating process for so many years now, and it is such a gratifying way to work with people. And today, I really hope to, if nothing else, empower you that you and only you can be the expert of your body. No diet, no person in the world can possibly know your thoughts, your feelings, how hungry you are, what satisfies you. Don't ever forget that. And as my daughter, who's now 26, said to me over and over again when she was two, you cannot be the boss of me, okay? It's a good answer. Okay. <laughs> She's now a high school Spanish teacher, okay. So today I wanna go over some core concepts and looking at what makes it so difficult to make peace with food in our body. I wanna go over some of the external forces that are going on, some of the stuff that happens on the internal level, and then more important, what do you do about it? What do you do about it? And I have to tell you, I work with a lot of university students because my office is right nearby a, a, a local university. So, for those of you who, who, news, for those of you who like to tweet, tweet away, I'm at, at eTribly, and that you can also use hashtag intuitive eating. I'm on uh, Twitter all the time with this kind of stuff, so. Um, what are the challenges that we have? We have this big old food fight going on. We have things happening in our culture. We have things that are confusing ourselves. I get calls all the time from people who say, I don't know how to eat anymore. We have more knowledge today than we ever did. We have information on the internet, on our food labels, and yet we get so stuck in what do I eat because there's so much confusion and things bombarding us. Okay, so first of all, we're living in kind of a screwy culture right now. We have got the beauty industry uh, ramming all these ideas about what our body should look like, whether you're a male or a female. We've got the well-meaning public health campaigns that, see we, that say that we should eat this way or that way, and I wanna go over some of this pressure that's going on. And what I have um, on that screen, you can see from the 2012 Olympics, I was just, oh, I was so disgusted by this, <laughs> okay? But they were criticizing the female, some of the female Olympians for being fat. They're Olympians. It's like, what are you doing talking about their bodies? They're performing amazing kinds of feats here. Okay, so let's just get a feel for the beauty industry. The beauty industry promises all kinds of things. We can have shiny hair. We can have skinny hair, okay? We can have glowing skin. We can scrub our fat to slim. I know, oh, this drives me nuts, okay. There's not a body part that can't be improved, according to beauty magazines and the media. Or clothes that you can't wear that won't flatter you somehow, skinny jeans. The day my son wanted skinny jeans, I about fell off my chair. It's like, what? Okay. Uh, whether you're male or female. We've got all the Photoshop junk going on. I don't know if you saw this uh, two years ago. This is the same model. Uh, on the left-hand side of your screen there, she was Photoshopped into an unrecognizable lolly stip, lolly, lollipop stick figure kind of thing, and it raised a great deal of outpouring of anger among what we're seeing in our magazines as if this is real. And one of the points I want to make really, really clear is that this is a serious business. You know, it wasn't that long ago that in the Chinese culture, foot binding took place. Because back then it was really thought for a daughter to have status, to marry into the right family, to do well, they had to have small feet. And so every day when the daughter turned about three years old, every night they would wrap their feet, their toes would go underneath there like this, and they'd walk and their bones would break. And every night the, the bandages got tighter. And the incidences of death and malformities and all the things that happened, as I'm reading about all this stuff, I was thinking, my goodness, how different is it than from today's real life issues going on in terms of this perception of how we need to look, okay? So I challenge you on that. And men are also getting the same kind of bombardment. Here we have men's fitness, you know, lose that gut. On this right-hand side, there's a new book out by, uh, Brian Cuban, now you might not know who he is, but you might know his brother, Mark, who's like this bazillionaire who owns the Mavericks. And 
Brian had uh, an eating disorder and body dysmorphia, and he has a tell-all book in terms of what he had to do to overcome it. So this is serious stuff. So we have this going on in our culture. Then we have the war on obesity. I'm not going to go into the details of this, just to say that it's really controversial. There, anybody, how many people here have heard of the obesity paradox? Anyone hear that term? What's been happening in some really, really big studies, major, major journals, is they're finding that, hey, it turns out that people who are overweight actually survive illness a lot better. And they're calling it the obesity paradox. Like, how can this be? And so meanwhile, the American Medical Association had a research council that did all this review of the literature. And they said, you know what? There's not enough data. There's not enough evidence to support the idea that obesity is a disease. So the AMA decided, let's vote on it, OK? They took a vote. And they decided, oh, yeah, it is. It's like, oh, my god, that's politics. Ugh, OK. So now we have this happening. We have the beauty industry. We have the medicalization of weight. Oh, and the weight loss industry. This, this just, uh, OK. $61 billion in revenue. It has doubled in the last decade. Okay. It's a great business to go into because it's the only one I know of in which the consumer buys a product that doesn't work and the manufacturer blames the consumer and the consumer believes it. So you have repeat business. Okay. And so then I invariably get this question, well, what about sensible dieting? What about Weight Watchers? And my answer to that is a diet is a diet is a diet. And what happens in the evening if your points are all gone? What do you do? You know, it's a diet. It's a problem. And I will show you why in a minute. So the other thing we have going on right now is we're living in this time where we're getting all of this food worry. We're like one bite away. We're one bite away from disaster. We're one bite away from obesity. If I take this one bite of food, I'm going to get fat, or I'm going to get cancer, or something's going to happen. So there's this fear. What has happened to the enjoyment of eating? and the satisfaction of eating that has gone away. And there was this great study published about 10 years ago. And they looked at four countries. They looked at the United States, they looked at France, Belgium, and um, Japan. And what they found is Americans worried the most about their eating. They were the least healthy, and they enjoyed their food the least. The French, however, they really didn't care about health, but they cared about the quality of their eating. And they enjoyed their food the most, and they were the healthiest of the bunch when this study was done ten, over 10 years ago. And this psychologist researcher made a very profound uh, remark, and he said, you know, we worry so much about the effect of food killing us or curing us, we haven't taken a look at the effect of the stress and the anxiety of this worry. And I think that was really, really profound. And we just recently updated Intuitive Eating uh, last year, the third edition. And so I went back and I said, you know, I wonder how good old France is doing. You know, God bless France, because you know what? They are so much healthier than us today. They have the third lowest rate of heart disease in the world. They have half the rate of obesity in both their adults and their kids. And they have lower rates of eating disorders and they enjoy what they're eating, and I think there's something to that. OK. So what ends up happening then is when we have this environment where we're being hit by appearance issues, we're hit by health issues, what does it do to you, the individual? Well, it creates obstacles. It creates doubt. It's hard to trust your body. And so what ends up happening is the attunement really goes awry. You know, you start developing food rules about all the stuff that you're hearing, about how you think maybe you should eat. You know, one way I've really kept my sanity, I, I graduated with my master of science degree, I think in, it was in 83, and I finally took the, the position, the idea that food is like fashion. It's trendy. Every year there's going to be something new, you know, and sure enough, it seems to be that way. Then we have other issues going on with distraction and reactiveness uh, to whatever is in our environment. And so what ends up happening is, we end up with rigid rules. I cannot tell you how many times when I've been in a mixed crowd of people. In other words, I'm not there because I'm a dietitian or an author. I'm just someone's friend. And they find out what I do for a living, and oh, all the apologies go up. you know. And it's become such a moral issue. And so when I have a patient say to me, you know, 
I felt really guilty. I go, what happened? And they'll say, I ate a donut. Really? Did you kill that person to get that donut? <laughs> they look at me like I'm mortified. Like, you Did you steal the money to get the donut? No. Did you steal the donut? No. Well, geez, you know, guilt's a mor moral-based uh, feeling. Let's take a look. What is this rule or this belief that you have? You can't enjoy a donut. And when you're feeling guilty when you're eating something, you're not enjoying it. Um, and there's all kinds of stuff that ends up happening. So there's no joy. There's no trust in the body. And that's what I hear all the time. And, you know, I was really lucky early in my career. You don't plan these things. It just happened. I was a squeaky new, you know, dietitian. And this is back when Julia Child was alive. And this is when the chefs and the dietitians or the nutritionists weren't getting along so well. And she's like, let's just get along. And so she created a task force of chefs and, and nutritionists. And we'd meet monthly. And I, I felt like one of Charlie's angels because her voice would come on the intercom. And whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, I never met her. But it was a profound experience because we came up with a conclusion or kind of a mantra almost like, to the chefs, in the matter of food, consider health. And to the nutritionists and dietitians, in the matter of health, please consider taste. And so taste has had a big impact on, on all that I do. Because if you don't like something, are you going to really stick with it? I don't think so. You might do it for a week, maybe a month. I used to work a lot with heart patients who'd have bypass surgeries and heart attacks. And here's what ended up happening. I don't mean to sound, well, this is just what would happen. They're terrified because they almost died. And then they realize they're going to live. They really know they're going to live. And all of a sudden, the, the, the eating now becomes, they don't, they don't really care anymore. And so if the food doesn't taste good, they're just going to do whatever. So we've got to get all of this back, the enjoyment. And so one of the problems that's happening are people living in their heads, OK, about the rules, about what you should and what you shouldn't do. And I love this, uh, this graphic, I'm not going to go into details on it, but it's actually based on some brain scan imaging on patients with anorexia, like how do they do what they do? And it turns out they live in their head and they ignore the direct message of their body. They ignore the direct message. And that's what I'm seeing in people even without eating disorders, okay? So what do we do to make peace? Well, the answer comes with you. It's with you connecting to you. And this is why I love this little picture of this little baby. You know, it's like, woo, checking himself out. Uh, <laughs> It's about self-awareness and listening to your body. And that's basically what intuitive eating is. It's becoming the expert of your body. And I think what makes it complicated today, besides all the stuff I just mentioned, is we are living uh, in a crazy busy time. There's a book called by that. I love the author. And he makes the argument, he's a psychiatrist, and he says, you know, we are nothing but uh, tin cans in a sea of magnets. And unless we decide our priorities and our intentions, we're going to be going in a million directions. We have become an ADD nation. And if we're distracted all the time, it's hard to listen to the message of our body. Or by the time you hear it, it has hijacked you <laughs> in a way that doesn't feel so good. OK. So I love this quote. Our body-obsessed culture thinks a lot about our bodies, but rarely take the time to feel their sensations. And this is so profound, and I'm going to share why this is such a profound concept. And this has to do with something called interceptive awareness. How many people have ever even heard that term, interceptive awareness? Thank you. we got like maybe one or two, three. Um, I was exposed to it maybe six, seven years ago, and I remember the first time I was blown away. I was reading the studies like, oh my god, this is so fantastic. And I thought, I've got to get the message out. And then I realized, I need to learn how to pronounce this word. <laughs> and so thank God, you know, we, I forget where I went to Wikipedia or medical dictionary. And, you know, you listen. I kept repeating, introceptive, introceptive. And anyways, I can finally say it. So anyway, this is an emerging area of research. And it's very, very exciting. Here's what's really cool about it. This is what's going on in, in our brain. And it has to do with our own sensations. It's our body's ability to perceive physical sensations. And here's what I love. OK, so this includes obvious things, like you know, if you have a full bladder and you need to use the restroom. OK, that's interceptive awareness. Hunger and fullness also has physical sensations. But did you know that every emotion, every emotional feeling has its own physical sensation? And so there's a lot that can happen if we can connect to that parts of our body. So here's the issue, though. And by the way, this is the right brain activity that goes on, this interceptive awareness. 
Dieting, on the other hand, is a left brain activity. It's all about the numbers. It's all about the counting. And so when someone is dieting, they're not connecting with their body. They're living in their head, which is why this can be so difficult. And I want you to really get an idea of what this interceptive awareness is. So I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to share a story with you. Okay? So I want you to think for a moment, maybe a time you got really scared, and think about how did that feel physically in your body? Well, I'm going to share a recent time with me I, that it happened to me. I love to hike. I'm an adventure seeker. But guess what? I don't like scary places. And so I'm going to tell you my story of the wall of terror. Okay. And so you see on that left-hand side, there's a bridge. They are teaching people how to bungee jump. That's how high we are. And we are hiking on this trail called the Bridge to Nowhere. Yeah, it's California. There's a bridge. It goes to nowhere. See on that other side? That's the other side of the bridge. And guess what? It is completely, there's no trail there. We had to cross that, I call it gecko style, where you lean in. And I was terrified. And so here's what was going on. My body physically, I froze. I was like this. And my guide was like, come on. And I didn't want to go. My heart was beating fast. Everything was beating fast. I felt very, very frozen. And then my mind got activated, and I realized to go back, because I'd already taken a few steps, it would be even scarier, because to go back on a wall of terror downhill, it's actually a lot harder than going uphill. And only because of fear, I continued on. It wasn't bravery, I'll tell you that. <laughs> okay. And so in this triangle of awareness, so the body sensations I had were actually tied into my emotions. My thoughts actually added even more, like I could die, I could fall down all the way, it's a straight down, the bungee jumpers don't even land because it's so steep. That was aggravating my own physical sensations. So now we use this concept that imagine someone who's chronically dieting. Oh my gosh, if I eat this cookie, I'm going to get so overweight. And then, and then, and then, and then, and you, you name the stories in terms of what's going to happen with life and on and on and on. And it really interferes with listening to your body. Now tonight, I don't have time to go into all the principles of intuitive eating, but I just want to introduce the general concepts. The first one I am going to spend some time on. And it's rejecting the diet mentality. If you remember nothing else from today, besides that you're the expert of the body and don't let anyone be the boss of you, is that dieting messes you up in such a big way. And I'm going to show you, OK? <laughs> it's really, oh. OK, the second principle is honoring your hunger. That sounds so basic, but it's really so tough for so many people. The third one I'm also going to spend some time on, and that's making peace with food. And it's a very misunderstood principle, and that is having unconditional permission to eat. And that's where people who don't know me or don't know the research might think I'm crazy. And I'll, but I'll, I'll show you why. There's actually a, a lot of good sound reason for this altogether. Um, challenging the food police. These are the, you know, the thoughts in your head or the community or someone telling you what to do. And they don't know your body. Uh, feeling your fullness. What does fullness feel like? You know, if you're someone who eats until the plate is clean every single time, and especially if you go out to eat, there's a high likelihood that you're eating more than what your body needs. You know, think about it. Whether you're five foot two or six foot two, they serve you the same amount of food. So where's the attunement with that? Um, discovering satisfaction in eating is one of my favorite principles. You're not supposed to have favorites, but it's one of my favorites because it's a pleasant place to start. You know, if, if, if you were to start with one principle, and they all integrate. You know, it doesn't feel good. It's not satisfying to overeat, and it's not satisfying to undereat. So working towards satisfaction is actually something that works on balance, that feels good. Seventh principle, how do you cope with your feelings without using food? You know, you've got a big midterm. You've got a final. You know, what do you do? I can tell you what a lot of the students I work with do. They pull all-nighters, and they eat and eat and eat and eat to keep themselves awake, when actually they might need a break from the studying. Eighth principle, respecting your body. Ninth, making activity enjoyable. And the tenth one is so ironic, gentle nutrition, honoring your health with gentle nutrition. And it's so ironic because Elise and I are both dietitians. We both have master's degrees in nutrition. And the reason it's our last principle is not because it's not important, is that so many people are so rule-bound that if we introduce this concept too early, it becomes embraced like another diet, and it doesn't, it doesn't serve the process. 
And another way of looking at the intuitive eating principles, they either work at helping improving that interceptive awareness, like honoring hunger, or removing the obstacles to interceptive awareness, like the thoughts and the rules and those kinds of things, okay? Now, what's so exciting today with intuitive eating, when we wrote this book, it was because we were stuck. We were writing all these beautiful you know, meal plans, and our patients were loving us, and they would do great, and they'd lose weight, and then they'd come back, they blame themselves, and you know what? Elise and I are like, this sucks. This is not working. This is not gratifying. These people are smart. They know what they're doing. And so, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Did you wake up? <laughs> and so, <laughs> surprise, I do that sometimes. <laughs> We went to the literature, we reviewed the research in terms of what was going on, along with our clinical practice. And that was in 95. And so what happened was, is we came up with this book. We were very lucky because our publisher loved the concept, but she also said, you know, great concept, but let's turn it into steps or something. And what was so brilliant about that, that we had no idea, that because we have 10 principles, it makes it measurable, okay? And so today, there's a lot of evidence and research out showing that this actually works. There's something to it. And I'm not going to go into the details in terms of who our influences were in terms of the scientific principles or whatnot, but it was, I would say, evidence-inspired. But today I can say we actually have evidence of, of efficacy. We need more data. But I got to tell you, it is so exciting. I just get so excited when I see a study. In fact, oh my God, okay. So there is this study that just got published out of um, Germany. And they looked at intuitive eating and interceptive awareness. They used those words. And what they found is, yeah, intuitive eaters have a higher level of interceptive awareness. And what blew me away, oh, higher interceptive awareness and lower body mass index, lower weight. And you know how they measured interceptive awareness? This was all new to me. Is they had people um, perceive their own heart rate. I'm thinking, oh, I can do that. Because you know, growing up in track and stuff, I'm used to any of this. But it's, it's feeling your heart rate, your heart beat without touching your heart, not without touching your pulse. So that's something fun for you to try on your own. Okay, you won't get hurt. Okay, can you feel your heart beating? All right. So then what ended up happening is just a series of things. It's like the research started coming out, uh, mainstream TV and media started picking it up. And there was also a lot of confusion. And I finally understood what happened with the confusion. Um, there was a researcher out of Utah who did a small study on intuitive eating, published it and did an interview in the local paper. And in his interview, he said, oh yeah, you know, I used to have trouble with my weight. I weighed 50 pounds more than I did, and I finally, I have no issues because of intuitive eating. And that story went worldwide, I'm not exaggerating, and the next thing I know, we're both on the Today Show after that story hit. And I'm used to being on the media. That, I mean, that was still a lot of fun. But after we did our interview, I got a lot of mixed messages. I thought it felt pretty good. And, but I, some people are saying, yeah, great. And other people are saying, oh, you know, you're just promoting a junk food diet. I thought, what is going on? So when I went back home and I looked at the video, I go, oh, I turned it off without the sound. And you know what they did? The camera just kept showing cookies and cakes and pastries. And so it looked like, yeah, yeah, eat all this and you're fabulous. And hence the mixed message. And so that's what this is not about. We can say, yes, you can certainly have those things. So anyway, to date, there's been about almost 30 studies now on intuitive eating and at least three underway as we speak. So it's just like, yes, okay, it's exciting, okay. I love what I do. Okay, and so just in a general ballpark, here's what we know from the research so far. Intuitive eaters have a lower body mass index. They are healthier. They have lower cholesterol. They have better self-esteem. They have lower rates of eating disorders and better well-being and on and on and on. Isn't that cool? It's like, yes, okay. Okay, so here's the four key characteristics of intuitive eaters. Maybe you can ask yourself, do you have these characteristics? An intuitive eater is someone who can rely on their own internal hunger and satiety cues and consistently do that. You don't have to be perfect. An intuitive eater is someone who has unconditional permission to eat. They can eat without apology, with attunement, okay? For example, I will tell you right now, when I love your town, I just love this town, and I heard lots of things besides the wonderful rivers and stuff, I kept hearing, scratch. <laughs> yeah. So guess what I had for my afternoon snack, with no apology, and with great satisfaction, I had the most amazing peanut butter cupcake. Oh. And I sat there, I turned off my cell phone, I turned off everything, and I enjoyed it. 
And then I realized I need a little latte with this. <laughs> and I went, I went and got a latte. So it's that kind of stuff. Okay, so uh, an intuitive eater eats for physical and not emotional reasons. And there's someone who makes choices based on, this is a new concept, body food congruence. In other words, when they eat something, they know how it feels in their body. So here's another story with me. Uh, you ever smell Cinnabon in an airport? Oh my God, it's an amazing smell. Love it. But you know what? When I eat them, I don't feel good. <laughs> I just, I don't feel good. So I don't eat them anymore. I might have one or two bites, but frankly, I don't want to spend $5 on a Cinnabon to eat one or two bites. So anyway, it, that's kind of an example of body uh, congruence. Now in the handouts that are on the website, I have a um, very quick little quiz for you if you want to check it out. And it's, and it's research validated for both men and women. This is brand new on 2,000 college students. It's you guys, most of you guys here, men and women, um, in terms of are you intuitive eater? And they're just yes or no questions. So that's for you to have and, and, and to check out. Okay, so let's get into like the so what factor. It's like, come on, Evelyn, tell us what to do. I always get patients that say that. Come on, just tell me what to do. It's like, but you got to listen to your own body. Okay, first step, and I cannot emphasize this enough is rejecting the diet mentality and I want you to get really really clear on why this is so important it affects your biology it affects your mind it causes weight gain how many people know that dieting actually causes weight gain anyone heard that before just some of you I want you to know this and I'm going to show you this and I don't want you to tell all your friends like oh my god it causes weight gain would you do something that caused weight gain if you're trying to lose weight it's just crazy oh okay Sorry, it just it works me up because I just I see so much pain in my office. So I want to start first with a study. This has been out since World War II. Now I love this because guess what? This is a study on college men. These were actually actually conscientious objectors, and what the scientists wanted to do was to really study the effects of under eating to see what we can do to save the world and all the short food supply that was going to happen because of the war. So these were healthy college men, college age men who had, they used a word, I don't remember what it is, but it, if you looked it up, it stood for like super duper, you know, amazing medical stamina and psychological stamina. They're very healthy in every way, sound mind and body. Then they put him on a restrictive diet and also some exercise. And here's what happened. During this time period, these men, these healthy men became obsessed with food. They started collecting recipes and cookbooks. Now keep in mind, this is the 1940s. We did not have TV Food Network and we didn't have any chefs going bam. Food was not cool to men back then. Just in general, I'm just saying, okay? okay? And all they were doing was like, you know, studying cookbooks and talking about food. They didn't know whether to eat fast or slow. It affected their bodies. Their me metabolism slowed down. That, that kind of is predictable. Their hair kind of fell out of bed and they got, you know, problems. But what really blew me away is how it affected their mind. They lost interest in girls. I know, yeah, I know you would get that, okay? They, uh, they could, one man couldn't stand the rules of the diet, so he went out and he stole candy. A conscientious objector stole candy, binged on it, made himself throw up because he felt so guilty. Another guy went out and binged on milkshakes, same thing. So here you take healthy men, put them on a restrictive diet, and you create an eating disorder. That's what they found. This has been known since the 40s. And by the way, guess how many calories these guys were on? When I first read this, I'm thinking, you know, not so much. But on average, they were eating 1,700 calories a day. Now, God, granted, they were college-age men. They needed you know, at least double that. But look what this does. Oh, OK. Now. Little kids, little children, ages 9 to 14, 17,000, they looked at kids who were dieting because their parents are worried, right? So they're putting their kids on diet. So just look at this on the very right-hand side. Look what happened to the girls and boys who dieted. They were 8 to 12 times more likely to engage in binge eating. Little kids. And I see those little kids as adults and as kids. It, it, well, I do. So when I see an adult... And I ask, you know, if they were ever on a diet when they were a little kid, and they'll say, yeah. And I'll say something like, well, you know, here's what usually I hear. I'm curious if this has happened to you. And, you know, your parents have well-meaning rules. You're not allowed to eat maybe desserts for dinner and that, or with dinner or at all. And so when no one's looking, you go out and you sneak the Girl Scout cookies or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. 
and then you feel really guilty. Yeah, because you're a little kid, you know? And what ends up happening then, that is a huge disconnect. Eating becomes one of opportunity when no one's looking or a certain parent's in a good mood. So that study blows me away. That was done in 2003. This study, this affects you guys here too. This was done for 10 years. They tracked teens through young adulthood, so ages like 13 to like 23. And what they found is that teens who were focused on losing weight, who dieted, who then started getting involved in eating disorder behavior and binge eating, and guess what? They had more eating disorder behavior and their weight went up. It's not innocuous. It causes harm. It causes problems. There was a study published just this month out of the International Journal of Eating Disorders on, I think it was 15,000 teens, and they found a very similar statistic. So it's like, why in the world would we want our kids to be dieting? Now, this study blew me out of the water, too. Can you tell I like studies? Like my, my dad, who's a retired engineer, he goes, you know, Ev, you got something about science and scientists. I go, yeah, I do. It's important to the work I do, you know? Anyway, so this study was on four thousand twins. In other words, 2,000 sets of twins, and the researchers asked the question, well, you know, maybe people who diet gain weight because they were genetically predisposed to begin with. So let's look at these twins and find out. And they tracked them for a long time. And what they found is that dieting independent of genetics increased weight, and it was dose responsive. Nail and coffin, okay? Like, holy moly. In fact, the researcher of this study concluded that dieting may be in part responsible for the current obesity epidemic. Ooh, okay? I'm not going to go into the details of this study. It was just recently published, and it talks about a phenomenon that these researchers have found called fat overshooting. And that is when someone goes on a diet, it actually triggers the body to create more fat and weight than which they began. So I ask you, what is healthy about that? Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, Nutrisystem, OptiFast, and all, all those. Oh, okay. So bottom line, dieting increases weight gain and the more diets that you go on, it does that. We've seen it in kids, teens, adults, twins. Many, many studies on adults have shown that, okay? So there is no such thing, in my opinion, as healthy dieting. When you look at this kind of data, okay? So then the question is, what do you do? Here's my fear, what well-meaning parents do. It's tough being a parent right now of kids or grandparents. You know, they hear all this obesity epidemic stuff, and so they don't want their kids to be obese, and they're hearing all of this oh, sensationalistic stuff. There was a study, uh, a, study a story, I was oh, mortified. Vogue magazine last year, a mom wrote about her seven-year-old diet who was declared um, obese by her doctor. And she was thrilled that the pediatrician said her daughter was obese because that was a scary term and now she could do something about it. P.S. Mom had eating disorder behavior history. She just took a few laxatives and purged every now and then. And Vogue published this. And the way the mom was treating the daughter, to me it's a recipe book for how to create an eating disorder. And sadly, because of the culture that we live in, the mom got a, a book deal. She was just on the Today Show this, this year. This is the culture that, that we're living in, okay? and this is the kind of pressure parents are feeling. Now, I especially wanted to mention this study because it involves you, sorta, okay? It's a unique study where they looked at college students, and they, and they asked the college students this question. What was it like when you were a little kid when your mom and dad fed you, you know, feeding practices? Then, they gave the same uh, questionnaire to the parents and asked the same thing, and here's what they found. So these are college-age kids who are being interviewed on what it was like when they were little. The college-age kids who, as toddlers, had parents who were restricting their eating and really monitoring their eating, the, for both men and women, they had higher weights and higher incidence of binge eating. And they also measured intuitive eating. They were scored much lower on intuitive eating. Okay? So intuitive eating is about your own awareness. It's your own connectedness. And so that's what we need to be teaching ourselves and our kids. One of the basic keys is honoring your hunger. Okay, I love this guy, this T-Rex, get a primal hunger. Sometimes I call it uh, PMS when I get it. It's like free meal syndrome, get me some food or I'm gonna kill you when I'm that hungry, okay? <laughs> it doesn't feel good, I will tell you that. It really doesn't, I don't like it. And yet, a lot of us get into those kind of situations. And what I see happening, this is so bizarre to me, I have patients without eating disorders who will tell me they're afraid of getting hungry. 
And so I ask them, why are you afraid of getting hungry? And then they tell me they're afraid they're going to overeat. And I said, really? Because, you know, hunger is a direct message from your body. You need to be fed. So what do you do when you feel hungry? I avoid it. Oh, you avoid it for a long time? Yeah. So then what happens, they cross over and they get into this primal hunger. And once you get to a certain hunger level, at that point, you don't care. It's like, give it to me, okay? And it takes more food to actually feel satisfied. And so this is something I see over and over and over again. It's something so basic that a lot of people don't get. And so if you're not feeding your body consistently, how do you expect to get a consistent message, okay? And so, you know, I wish, uh, I've had patients tell me this. They call it... I, I, I'll give an example. You know, it's funny, when, you, when you're hungry, that's a natural response. It's like saying, well, I need to go to the bathroom. And I've had patients call that intuitive peeing, you know. And I'll say, you know, it's actually a really good example of interceptive awareness, only there's no guilt involved. You don't go to the bathroom and say, ooh, did I pee too much? Did I pee too little? It's like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> you might say it's inconvenient. It's like, God, I just peed an hour ago. Okay, that can happen. But it's, 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 there's no guilt involved on this stuff. And so we've, we're in this culture now where our normal response of hunger is suddenly becoming demonized. It's, it's healthy to be hungry. It's good. It feels good to eat that way. And so what I see happening with a lot of people is they, they don't, I'll ask them, well, what does hunger feel like to you? What is gentle hunger or polite hunger? Well, what's that? And I'll say, well, tell me how you feel hungry. Oh, I have a headache or I'm dizzy or I can't concentrate. And so by the time someone's feeling like that, that's extreme kind of hunger, and that doesn't feel good. Gentle hunger is where you're, you're, you're hungry, you're looking forward to eating, but you're not going to kill anyone yet. So, yeah, get away from me. Okay. <laughs> okay. There's also been a series of studies like just looking at uh, people just recognizing hunger and responding to hunger out of Italy, and what they found is that people who were trained to recognize hunger, they actually had lower body weights, they had um, better insulin levels, better, uh, better uh, blood sugars as well. And so the researcher of this study said, you know, I think maybe we're having all this obesity epidemic stuff because people don't recognize their own hunger. Okay, I think there's something to that. Either they're denying it, they're distracted, or they're getting a message. A lot of the weight loss companies not too long ago were demonizing hunger like it's something, it's a problem. Hunger's not the problem, it's everything else. It's eating an absence of hunger. It's eating fake foods that don't satisfy you. I'll never forget, I had a patient who, oh my God, what was she, she was, I forget where she was, I think she wanted like an ice cream cone from like, do you have Baskin Robbins out here? I think that's a West Coast thing. Oh, you do, okay. So, you know, it's good food, right? Good ice cream. And she said, no, 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 not too, it's not healthy. So she denied herself and thought she was being very good by doing so, in her own words. And so when she came home, she decided to have Weight Watchers ice cream sandwiches. And it just wasn't hitting the spot, so she ate about the whole box. <laughs> and actually, if she had had that scoop of ice cream that she didn't allow herself, it actually, ironically enough, would have actually been even more satisfying and, and fewer calories and not, not all the guilt. So this is the part I want to talk about making peace with food. It's really, really critical, okay? Now, I want to be really clear. I am not saying that an apple is nutritionally the same as apple pie. No, it's not. Of course it's not. Emotionally, it's the same. You're not a good or bad person if you choose apple pie. You're not an idiot if you choose apple pie. The way some of these um, companies advertise things, it makes people sound like they're idiots because they, they didn't make the smart choice. So what does that mean? They're an idiot. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm dumb. I didn't choose the smart thing. So what is making peace with food about? It's about having permission to eat with attunement. You do pay attention to hunger and fullness and satisfaction. And this is based on a series of studies, habituation studies. This is so cool. This has been shown in so many things. Basically, the novelty wears off. Like, you ever get a new car and you're so excited? Oh, my God, new car. Even if it's an old used car, but it's new to you, it's so exciting. And then after a while, eh, it's my old car. Or if you're like, maybe fall in love for the first time or have a girlfriend or boyfriend for the first time, it's like, oh, and the person says, I like you or I love you, and it's so magical. And then 10 years later, of course you should, <laughs> you know? It's, it's not the same. That's what habituation is. And that's what it is in food. There's been tons of research studies on habituation and eating. And one of my favorite studies is on college students and pizza. So imagine this, imagine this. They say to you, hey, if you enroll in our study, we're gonna give you free dinner every single night. Although maybe you already have your meal card, so it's not a big deal or something. But so they gave these uh, students free pizza every night. And it's like, yes, pizza, woohoo, pizza. Day 27, they want pizza. 
Okay, that, that's what habituation is, okay? The novelty, where the emotional aspect of it wears off. And so making peace with food is having this emotional neutrality. Because when you have emotional neutrality, guess what? You get to actually taste the food. Gosh, do I really like it? I can have it. Do I really want it now? If I eat it now, am I going to enjoy it? And by the way, that cupcake I told you I bought, I actually bought it to have after my lunch. But when I finished my lunch, I was full. And I knew if I was going to eat it, then I wouldn't enjoy it. So I waited. <laughs> okay? It was nothing magical about me because I knew I could have it. Again, if I wanted to. The problem, what happens is when someone's chronically dieting, they do not have this habituation experience. Instead, food stays very, very exciting. When you're on a diet, you've got the rigid rules. When you're off the diet, it's like, hooray, I get to, you know, eat something else. And what tends to happen is that's so exciting, they can't stop the eating. And then they say, oh, I need to have those rules back. And so food stays exciting. Food must be controlled. And so we see this phenomenon that we call last supper eating. And this is when any time enters a diet. It's like, okay, I'm going on the blah, blah diet, so goodbye to you ice cream. Eat it up, goodbye, French fries, and then all this food. And what blows me away, I have patients that come in to see me. They've read intuitive eating. They understand the process. And I'll be asking them some questions and general idea about their eating, like, what did you have to eat yesterday, as an example? And they start to apologize. I go, well, you know, I don't usually eat this way. I don't usually eat, you know, french fries, a milkshake, apple pie, onion rings, da, da, da. I go, oh, well, so why would you do it today or this whole week? Because I was coming in to see you. And there's like this habit that, that they're in, too. And so this is what gets charged up every time. And the cool thing is, is when someone is ready to make peace with food, and it's important that it be done when they feel ready and not stressed out about it, I am blown away about how many times they discover, oh, I don't like french fries. Or, gosh, I like french fries, but only if they're really hot. I don't want them limpy or cold and all these things. And so you get to taste the food for the first time and see, do you even like it? Is it worthy of your taste buds? So it removes all the excitement. But if you think that you eat a cupcake or ice cream, whatever it is, and it's the last time you're ever going to have it, do you think you're going to even stop and ask, do I want it now? If it's your only opportunity, it keeps it alive. And I'm going to tell you some habituation stories. Um, you know, I've written a couple of cookbooks, and one of them was a dessert cookbook. Hooray, desserts! And, you know, food's never been really limited in my family, except for one occasion, which I will tell you in a minute. So, you know, I do my, my cookies chapter, and everyone's excited. Cookies! By the end of that, I couldn't sell a cookie. Cakes! Everyone's excited, you know, because everyone get, gets habituated. My son, when he was a toddler, was diagnosed with celiac disease. And as you all know, there's no gluten on that. And this was, well, he's 19 now, so that was like over 15 years ago. Uh, it was really hard. And because I always wanted my son to be socially connected and not left out, when school started every year, we'd go to Costco, buy a case of peanut M&Ms, because they're gluten-free, give them to the teacher and say, hey, if there's some unexpected class party, you know, he can have these, at least to be part of the celebratory process. So the reason I'm giving you that detail, because now I'm going to tell you a real-life mom story. Yeah, this happened. How old was Connor? I think he was 9 or 10. I'm upstairs. He's downstairs. And he's shouting out, Mom, there's nothing to eat. And I'm doing an inventory in my head. It's like, ooh, yeah. I mean, there was food, but not that he would, you know, in the freezer and whatnot. And I had to go grocery shopping. But then I remembered, oh, we have peanut M&Ms. So I yelled back down, Connor, eat the peanut M&Ms. He yells back at me, I don't want any, okay? Because this is a kid who can have all the, you know, that all the time. That's what habituation is. And so the other thing I see happening with all the fear with parents is they're limiting their, their, their kids' eating. When my son was two, I'll never forget this. I made this amazing cake. I love to cook. I love to eat. I served everyone the same amount of food. Connor's two at this age. He eats the entire carrot cake, and he looks at me, and he goes, more, Mommy. And I have to tell you, in that moment, there was part of me that was like, dude, you had enough. But it's like, no, let the intuitive eater go. Let, let him, you know, give him another piece of cake. So I served him the exact same piece. Do you know he ate one bite of that cake? I'm done, okay? <laughs> but what's happening today, what I see is parents are afraid to do something like that because they're assuming the whole second piece is going to be eaten. Or that child hasn't had that much you know, that kind of food, and so they get so excited that they get to have it, they eat it all. And so the kid who's rigidly monitored, that's the kid who gets excited at the birthday parties, not for the fun and the gifts. It's, oh, the food and all that kind of stuff. That's the issue. Now, one thing I want to get really clear about with this permission is 
Attunement needs to be there. This isn't like, I can have it whenever I want to just because I want to. That's not attunement. That, that also doesn't feel good either, okay? Sometimes people go through rebellion eating, you know, when they do that. So what this permission is, is, is a paradox. And the best example I have of this is, um, this is actually white water rafting, but I, I do, I've done some white water kayaking. And when you go, you probably know because there's a river here. I, don't, I haven't seen the rapids, but uh, since your city's named Cedar Rapids, there are rapids nearby, maybe? Okay, anyway, when you get to a boulder, you're instructed to lean into it. And I gotta tell you, that goes against every bit of my instinct to lean into a boulder as you're going so fast down that river, okay? In this picture, that's my daughter and I, and we're not only leaning in, we're like, you know, we're ducking for cover. And yet, boom, we, uh, we survive every time. And every time, develop trust. And so if you're someone who has struggled with overeating or chronic dieting and have this kind of relationship, in the beginning, that's what it can feel like. Like, oh my God, are you crazy? Once I start eating, I'll never stop. It's like going into that boulder. It's because the trust hasn't been there. And it's important that you embark on this when, when you feel ready, you know? Um, it's important. I wanna address for just a moment the issue of food addiction, because it comes up so often now, I just would want to just say briefly some things about it. What about food addiction and having permission to eat? Okay, see all these pictures here? Aren't they cute? These all represent the, what the, the brain looks like addiction. Um, when a mom looks at their baby smiling back, if they do a brain imaging study, their brains light up like cocaine euphoria. That's what they found, yeah. Um, same thing, true love. First love, especially. A lot of research on that. Uh, and when they break up and they look at the brain, it's like withdrawal. Music, a study published two years ago, blew me away. They found that the mere anticipation of music would light up the cocaine euphoria region in the brain. And then once it hit, you get all the dopamine and all these fabulous things. And also doing things like play. So my point is, we are wired to do things that feel good, that help us survive. And does it mean that it's addicting? I'm addicted to my baby, <laughs> you know? I'm addicted to music, <laughs> you know? I will never love again because I'm addicted. I mean, it's just, <laughs> okay. And so the research on food, I, I, it's, it's driving me nuts because there isn't that much out there, solid-wise. We are meant to be enjoying food, okay? You all familiar with the Pavlovian study where Pavlov rang a bell, gave the dogs a cookie over and over and over again, but pretty soon you just ring the bell and they salivate, right? That's conditioning, learned conditioning. Well, a very important part of that study that doesn't get talked about as much is he also trained them to decondition that response. He'd ring the bell, no cookie, ring the bell, no cookie, and guess what? They stopped salivating. So that's not, that's not addiction either, okay? Um, there's other explanations. Food's supposed to be rewarding so we survive. Now, one of the, the things is that when you're hungry, food is more rewarding in the brain. If you've been dieting, food is more rewarding. And so when you look at the studies, when they're imaging people and human brains, they don't usually control for dieting. So what is it that we're looking at, okay? So there's a lot more questions. And when you look at the issue of the binging and food addiction or whatnot, I would say with all the research showing that dieting and food restriction alters our brain pathways. The issue to me, the problem is dieting. Dieting is the gateway, you know, but all this does is give you is more fear mongering. Lastly, you would think if food addiction was really a significant issue, a viable theory, that if you gave people with binge eating disorder, bona fide binge eating disorder, their food of choice, their trigger food, that they would actually become more overeating, right? Well, there have been four studies now to date showing, nope, that's not what happens. You give them their forbidden food, with permission, and the uh, binge eating goes down so much more, they don't even meet the criteria, I'm sorry, for food addiction. So I just say that to you. There's a lot more questions on this issue. And to me, the, the issue of food addiction is a lot of fear mongering. It's making people afraid to eat. So that's on that. So we gotta challenge the food police. Who's the food police? Is it you? Is it your family? Is it culture? Is it coach? Is it, you know? Um, and this is, this is brain training, and this is what I tell my patients. Man, we've got to train your brain. We've got to make some more neural pathways for every repeated thought. Give me 10, you know? Uh, we need to look at this differently. Who says this is so? Really? So you're afraid this cookie's gonna make you fat, okay. Um, 
How many cookies do you have to eat for that to happen? Well, if, if I eat 10, did you eat 10 today? No, and on and on and on. It's just challenging this, this fear that happens. Feeling fullness. What does fullness feel like in your body? The satisfied kind of fullness that, that feels good. If it's pain, that's not a good sign, okay? Obviously. Now, there are exceptions. If you're stressed out, if you're sick, if you have an eating disorder, a mood disorder, yeah, your hunger and fullness cues are going to be wacky, that's for sure. So what do you do? Well, your body still needs fuel, just like a Ferrari. Beautiful car is not going to go if there's no gas in it. And so sometimes eating becomes an issue of self-care. So when you're studying and pulling an all-nighter and you're not really feeling hunger and fullness, what foods, what meals in your body feel good and sustain you? Those are the things I would be looking at. So satisfaction, I was mentioning earlier, is one of my most favorite principles of intuitive eating. And that's one of the questions I have for you. What makes a meal satisfying? What makes a food satisfying? How about the people you're with? If you're hanging out with a bunch of your friends and all they're doing is complaining about, oh my god, this is so many calories, or oh, this is going to go straight to my behind, does that in help you enjoy your eating? You know? Um, I, I don't think so. I haven't met anyone yet, but that, like, yeah, that feels good. I don't care for the term mindless eating, because it makes you sound like you're a fool or something. So I like to use the term distracted eating, like distracted driving. Because if you eat and do something else at the same time, it interferes with satisfaction. Your brain doesn't register it. And there have been study after study after study that shows this. Even though you know you're eating, and you know it tastes good, and you know you're doing your homework, or you're studying, or you're texting, or whatever you're doing, there's part of the brain that missed out on that experience. And eating goes way, way up. People who eat and do something else at the same time will end up eating more food at that particular event, and then later on in the day. And so my challenge to you is this. You don't have to be a perfect eater. You don't have to be a monk and like, oh my god, you know, <laughs> eating solitary and everything is, is pure and no distraction. But can you do it once a day? Can you do it, you know, most of the time or at least some of the time, but not in an automatic kind of thing that you're always studying, always talking, that kind of stuff? Because that's a disconnect. How are you going to know your body if you're not paying attention to it? Okay? How are you going to unplug? This is how I, I, I've never told my son this, so shh, don't tell him. <laughs> I wanted him to unplug, and I didn't want to get in arguments about this. I thought, gosh, we're going to go on vacation. Everywhere there's an outlet, you know? Oh, nature. So we went whitewater kayaking, and it was in Oregon, and this is a picture of him picking berries. Now, boysenberries have thorns, and it's, I tell you, it's the most satisfying, mindful eating experience we've ever had, because you're kayaking all day, and oh my god, you're starving, and you're waiting for the camp to be set up. It's vacation, so someone else was doing that for us. So we'd be picking this, oh, look at this, and looking at it and tasting it, it was, oh, so satisfying. But now, you know, you just you drive through someplace, and we don't have those kinds of experiences. So what do you need to do in order to unplug or enjoy a meal or two? Okay. What do you do to cope with your stress or feelings without food? Questions to ask. What am I feeling right now? Okay. Am I feeling sad, lonely, mad? Um, what do I need right now to deal with this feeling? And the irony, there have been a lot of studies on dieters, and they show that actually when you're on a diet, it actually increases stress. It increases the cortisol release. So it, it, there's a suggestion that dieting in of itself amplifies the emotional connection with, with using food as a rewarding kind of thing to get you through, okay? Respecting your body. I, I cannot stress this enough. Um, the stories I hear from the teens and the college kids I work with. I have a 12-year-old boy right now. He's breaking my heart. He uh, was afraid of getting fat, and so he just stopped eating desserts and stuff. And so now it's affecting his, his growth, you know? And he's starting to do better. And the other day I'm looking at his food journal. I'm talking to him. I say, hey, this is a great day. And he ate foods he wasn't eating in a while, like, you know, a milkshake and stuff. I go, this is fantastic. What helped you be flexible with this? Oh, I went surfing and I played volleyball all day with my friends, you know? So on the one hand, he's moving towards the direction, but in his mind, he had to pay penance with it, and so that's a problem. Body dissatisfaction increases your risk for both obesity and an eating disorder. 
it makes things so much worse, and it's so unkind. There's so much suffering in the world because people don't like their bodies, and it's not, it's not funny. Anytime anyone has ever cracked any kind of body joke, I'm such a buzzkill, I'll say, you know what? That is not funny. That is not, it's a serious issue. Honest to God, I was on a date, and I almost got run over by a car, not by my date, but the guy walking, well, anyway, the guy, <laughs> here's what happened. We're walking to dinner, boom, someone almost runs me over. He saved the day, he really did. I could have gotten really hurt. And he was mad, and he went and chewed out the young woman driving. And in his chewing out, he called her uh, a derogatory name about her body, okay? He called her Fat B. So uh, we're walking back, and I said, you know, I really appreciate you saving my life because I actually think you did, but what you just said back there is, is really wrong, and it's uncalled for. You have a daughter, and I gave him this big old, this is what I do. We, we don't have to educate the whole world, we just go one on one. My son, oh, he's been, okay, anyway, I'm, I'm gonna go there. So anyway, he knows, okay? In fact, I used to quote Yoda to him, because he used to have, you know, small stature. Size matters not, size matters not, we all have soul. So we need to appreciate our here and now body, what our body can do for us. It's, it's amazing what it can do, okay? And I just love this. I love this. Is it really your body that's been untrustworthy or is it the way you've been caring for it? And what I do with my little kids to help with this body concept, I have them, I talk about health at every size. And I'll say, you know, bulldog is pretty big, you know, puppy. Oh, yes, they're so cute. An Italian whippet, they're so, you know. But is the bulldog like a, a bad dog because it's bigger? You know, I do stuff like that. And, ugh. So what are you doing to take care of your body? What are you doing to get enough sleep? Having enough time with friends and so on and so on. These are important things. What do you do to enjoy exercise? You know, when I work with someone and, they, and I ask them about activity, they go, oh yeah, I do a spin because it burns a thousand calories and I'm there. Who cares? And I don't mean it in a mean way. Actually, I might think, I don't know if I say it like that because that sounds kind of rude as I'm saying it out loud. Uh, but I'll say, do you enjoy it? Because if you don't want to enjoy it, you're not going to sustain it. I want to help you find something that you enjoy. That's what's so important. And uh, I, just, I had to take some pictures this morning, and so this is some stuff I enjoyed today. I don't care if I burn calories or not. In fact, see that bench there? I sat there, and honest to God, I felt like I was in one of those Beatles movies, because I sat there and I meditated. <laughs> it was so beautiful. I really did. I know that sounds so Californian, but I did. Because um, just I was in the zone. I was taking care of my mind and my body at the same time. So what do you do? for fun? What do you do to promote the love of movement? One of my favorite activities to recommend to people who haven't exercised in a while because they're afraid or they're not fit is actually kayaking. Because if you're, if you're especially in still water, if you're tired, you just stop, you know? And you're in a boat, so it's, it's kind of cool. And it helps us connect. Now, what about nutrition? We hear so much about this. And this is going to sound really weird, but I'm going to quote myself <laughs> the book, okay? So here's what we recommend. And that is, enjoy eating food. Not too much, not too little, but mostly what satisfies you. And that's actually a take off of Michael Pollan's work in his uh, Eater's Manifesto. We've got to get back to this, because you know what? If you're satisfied, you're done. It's it. But if you're eating a bunch of air food, you're eating a rice cake with applesauce, and you call that pie, uh-uh, your body knows the difference, okay? <laughs> I had a patient freaking out. Because there, I feel so bloated. I gained all this weight. So wait, what's going on? I forget what was she eating. I looked at this, and it had all of these like sugar alcohols and acetals that causes bloating. I said, you know, here's the good news. The good news is, what you're describing to me physically matches the ingredients of this bar, because you're feeling the bloating. But your mind has been so habitually trained that anything that's uncomfortable means you've gained weight is not true. You know. So what would be more satisfying? You know, a pure piece of chocolate or like a diet chocolate-like beverage, you know? We call it a shake. Those are the things I look at. And at the same time, if you're going to eat rich foods, are you going to eat it in a manner that you're actually going to enjoy it and love it and taste it at that moment? I happen to love chocolate. My sister happened to buy me some Godiva while we were shopping one day. And she was all proud of herself. Like, right there, my little puppy, when he does something really good, it's like, look at me, look what I did. So, and she says to me, aren't you going to eat it, Ev? 
I go, yeah, but when I can sit down and pay 100% attention, you know? So it's that kind of thing, and only you will know what that is. Now, when we look at this whole idea of our ginormous portion sizes, and yeah, they've gotten really big, no doubt. CSPI, Center for Science and the Public Interest, they do a lot of good, they do a lot of food police stuff in the media, I think, to change policy. And they always give awards for the most calorie-rich menus and things you can find. These are all like, you know, two million calories each or something. <laughs> so my, my argument is this, is that it doesn't matter where you go to eat. If you're connected with hunger, fullness, and satisfaction, you're going to stop when you've had enough. Whether they serve you a 20-pound steak or, you know, a two-ounce steak, that becomes less of an issue. So, but if you have these rules about what's good and what's not good and what's bad, then that's a problem, okay? So ultimately then, intuitive eating really to me is about acquiring authentic health. It's taking our, our public health guidelines, yeah, but it's integrating it with you, how things are feeling in your body when you exercise, when you eat certain foods, when you get enough sleep, and then together you get authentic health. This picture I have up here, I just, this is a real picture. I was hiking um, in the hills of uh, Laguna Beach, and it's just amazing. I got a hiking ticket there, too, believe it or not. I wish I could say it was speeding, but the sun was down, and so that's illegal, apparently. Anyway, so what I want to close with is this, is only you can be the expert in your body. Your thoughts, your feelings, your experiences, your hunger, your satisfaction, only you. No scale or diet could ever possibly know that. And so I close with this cartoon. <laughs> Don't step on it, it'll make you cry, it'll make you cry. It's true, I've seen a lot of tears. So I wanna thank you all for being here. And if you've got questions, yes? Oh, okay, thank you, I'm being cute over here. Um, we have microphones here to the, to your left and over here to the right, so come on down. I'd be happy to answer questions. If you're not comfortable asking questions publicly, I'm gonna stay here afterwards. If you have personal questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Okay. over here um, if you could those of you who are leaving if you could leave quietly we are we several people do have questions um, so there's going to be a question and answer time thank you. go ahead I would love to hear your um, take on the exciting new research in gut biota and it's influence with what we eat yeah. and our appetite and satiety. It's really exciting and has potential, and I'm wondering if it has informed. Uh, the question has to do with the, uh, with the uh, bacteria in our guts and all the research coming out in terms of health and maybe how does this affect intuitive eating, I guess is ultimately what you're asking. And what I find fascinating is the studies coming out showing that depending on the kind of bacteria in your gut, they actually might produce more calories in your body. And so in terms of intuitive eating, <laughs> this research is also new. I don't know what I would answer in terms of how does it affect that, but to me, it, it adds to the complexity of obesity and, and health and weight and all these kinds of things. So um, does that kind of... <laughs> Help it all? Well, if it changes our cravings. If it changes, if it changes what? If it changes our intuition about what we want, that if we eat a lot of refined white flours and oh. foods, that it changes what we crave. That's a, that's a good question. Are you asking, does it change what we crave, or have you seen research saying that it does change? I believe there's, there's a lot of exciting research out there that's saying the that it changes the satiety signals and it changes some of the hormones that regulate fullness. Well, I think it'd be exciting to see. I, so that I when we're on a carbo know. binge, you know, we, it might be a self-fulfilling, that's what I want. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting as you say that, when you look at just bacteria in the gut in general, well, having more plant-based eating helps with that. 
I didn't speak a lot about nutrition, nutrition today, but nutrition is a part of an intuitive eating, you know? In fact, I get patients who will ask me, well, when do I get to start eating healthy? Anytime you want to, you know? And so looking at maybe, gosh, what do you need in order to enjoy vegetables? What might you want to try in order to, to do that in terms of what might be satisfying or those kinds of things? And looking at it from that angle as opposed to beating someone up with, one of the issues I've had come across is when people have been doing a lot of dieting, they're so burnt out on vegetables, they associate it with dieting. And so sometimes they have to kind of work through that. And once they've started making peace, it kind of starts to happen. So to address your question also, that's I think the question looking at just whole foods in general, what does that mean? You know, I, I, I tend to go more base toward that, but I'm always empowering the individual. What's your stance on things like calorie-free soda or things that are supposed to be uh, less calories but actually do still taste pretty good? Is that a good idea or a bad that's idea? That's a great question on calorie-free soda. You know, I've, for the longest time, my, my preference and belief has been about I just would rather have whole foods. And there's been a lot of interesting research now coming out on sugar substitutes in terms of a couple of things. Is one, on animal studies, they're actually causing weight gain, number one. Number two, increasing insulin resistance, which is part of a weight gain cycle and also an issue around breast cancer they've been looking at. And four, some new reward-based research suggesting that that artificial sweeteners might taste sweet, but we don't get the double hit of the reward that we get both in our brain and then in our gut. And so now there's also new taste, I can't believe this, taste bud receptors for sweets in our gut, you know? And so beverages and fluids are the one thing, actually humans, we don't do so well on in terms of having a connection with, with regulation. And so when it comes to beverages, if we're looking at thirst, my first recommendation is to go for water because that's what our body actually really needs. And so I, I go with, with that. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Oh, oh. oh there's a question here. Okay, I'll yeah, go this way. That's what I thought. Hi. Hi, Evelyn. My name is Jesse. I'm a dietetics student, a soon-to-be RD, and some of my awesome preceptors are here in the room, too. Um, and I have been meeting with um, a lot of people, as I'm sure you have, who understand um, tuning into those cues if you are really enjoying the food, but they have a huge problem with food waste. Mm. And even if they're not enjoying the food, just seeing it sit there and having to throw it away or get rid of it, what's um, some advice for those people? I have a couple of things on that. Is, is one is, you know, the concept of that maybe it's going to waste in your body if your body doesn't need that food. I actually have... Um, Activities I'll have patients do. I'll never forget this. Uh, I had a very wealthy, wealthy patient. He had like, he never, I'll never forget this. He goes, Evelyn, I can buy any car I want to. But when it comes to food, can't waste it because it was really, ra he's really raised with it as a value system. And so we really had to work through that. So I had the intellectual buy in, but the actual doing of it caused him discomfort. So I had him buy something cheap that he liked. I forget what it was, like cheap candy. And the, but the whole purpose of buying more than he needs, but then he'd actually go through the practice of throwing it out on purpose. And so I've done those kinds of things because what, what they're working up against is, is this value. I'm not saying that's what you have to do, but if you keep going through this cycle and they're having great difficulty with it, so the issue is of disconnect. So I'd be asking things like, well, can you take it home with you? Can you start with less food? What, what's the issue that's going on with that? Um, and if they're really, I'm, I'm working with someone right now, actually, with an eating disorder who has that, it's actually an obsession. And so it's, because she grew up in a very food insecure household as well, so we're looking at some other altruistic things that she can be doing so she can let that part go with herself. So part of it is just finding out what, what is the meaning for the person, what is the value they're hitting up against, do they want to work on this, do they want to change, and what do they need to do in small steps to get comfortable towards doing that. And that's a big part of this process. It's one thing to intellectually get it, like, yeah, dieting doesn't work, but how do you move through to where they really get it for themselves, that they really trust their body, they want to. They might trust it works for other people, but not for themselves. So part of what we're doing is helping to facilitate experiences and processes that connect them with their own body to see that it works. They have their own proof their body works. So, okay. Hi. 
Uh, yeah, what kinds of reactions have you had from uh, the uh, dieting industry? What, what, from the dieting industry? Yeah, what kind of re uh, reactions because you know, of your stance? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I've, uh, <laughs> I haven't had any direct actions, but I've, I've had some people say to me, hey, this sounds like Weight Watchers, or hey, this sounds like, you know, like intuitive eating sounds like this. And so there hasn't been any direct kind of thing. But what I see is, here, here's the problem, I guess, the challenge, is they're trying to sell their programs as a lifestyle program. And to me, that, that does a bigger disservice because you're, it's still on shaky ground. So it's an inherent conflict of interest. In fact, if you go on to, oh, I forgot to mention this. We have a free community, the intuitive eating um, community support. It's for free. And we have some people who are former like, leaders of Weight Watchers and all those kinds of stuff. And the stories they tell just kind of reinforce this, this problem. I have no you know, a problem with anyone who wants to get healthy and, and, and do well, but to do it in an exact way with the disconnection, I think, is, is a disservice. So, you know, the day the Wall Street Journal reported that it was either Nutrisystems or Jenny Craig or Weight Watchers, they were going to France to introduce dieting, because America's diet really well. I thought, oh my God, even their corporate people don't get it, you know? <laughs> So I, I guess I haven't had a direct reaction from any of them or a lawsuit, if that's what you're asking. So, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I had a question in regards to children and promoting intuitive eating with children. I recently watched a mealtime with a, a mom and a young daughter. I think she's like seven. And mom just had a heck of a time trying to get her to sit down and eat anything besides what she wanted, which was chocolate. And I just... I didn't know, she was just panicked, this mom, you know, she mm. couldn't get her to eat anything other than the chocolate, which is, you know, so do you, what do you, what do you recommend, or what would you tell that mom? Well, it's interesting what you're saying about the mom, because often we have to look at what, what energy the parent is putting out there, because yeah. the kid is often reacting to the energy, and so, um, I often quote Leanne Birch, actually, <laughs> who said something like, uh, in a very scientific paper, that if you look at a toddler's eating, it's a parent's worst nightmare. It's like, oh, I was so funny, I couldn't stop laughing. And went on to say that if you look at their eating on a, on a finite, like one day, one meal basis, it's a disaster. It, but if you take it back and look at the two weeks, it all averages out and they get hungry. And so I'd be working with the mom on, well, are they providing regular meal times, balanced meals, those, those kinds of things. And what happens though, and I'm seeing a lot of this problem is, Parents tend to reinforce picky eating syndrome, you know, where the kid will only eat macaroni and tater tots or something, and that's all they serve. And so they're not exposing them to new foods. And so it takes a child an average of 15 times to try a new food before they adopt it as their own. They have this natural neophobia, and in theory, that's why we're still alive today, because if we popped anything in our mouth and we died, we wouldn't be here. So, so it's this idea that you introduce the food, but, but not put any energy into an expectation as to what's going to happen. So does that, does yeah, that help? Yeah, thank you very okay. much. Yeah. Okay, well this is very relevant because my question is about my four-year-old son oh. who does not like to eat much at dinner but loves ice cream and sweets and stuff. Is it bad to tell him to you know, take a couple bites of your veggies, a couple bites of your meats, and then you can have that bread or that treat or something? We always like withhold whatever he wants until he eats a little bit of what he's supposed to. Is that Well, here's the challenge with what problem? you're describing, and I understand what, what, you're, what you're doing. Um, it's almost saying that these other foods are so lousy, to get your reward, you've got to eat these two bites, and then you can have this other stuff. Yeah. And so, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so part of it is we don't want to have this emotional power struggle that, that goes on. And so it would be having the expectation, you know, that you're not a short order cook. And this is where I really love Ellen Satter's model. We, we actually include it in this update of uh, intuitive eating, all on family and kids chapter. And that is, just because your child wants to eat ice cream, but for dinner you have already made X, Y, and Z, you don't suddenly pull out the ice cream, you know? And so it's what you're doing as, as a family and, and changing it up. So like when we, with my kids, we'd have, we'd have dessert sometimes, but it wasn't always an expectation. And so um, this idea that they just have to wait it out, you teach them to be really good at uh, working you, you mm -hmm. know? <laughs> Eventually, they'll get the ice cream or the dessert, the chocolate, or something like okay. that. Okay. Well, even if it's something healthy, like you love sweet potatoes, so we're like, okay, we'll hold back on the sweet potatoes to get him to eat the other broccoli or something. Like, is that still bad, even if it's so I, healthy? So I would actually put all the food out that you have and, and not be vested in what, what he picks. And there's been a lot of research, and I've seen this also just in my practice. What parents do, what they eat, is actually 
so much more powerful than the nudging. The more nudging, the more energy you put into that, the less that your kid's going to want to do it. I know it sounds bizarre, but that's what I see over and over again. And again, because we're living in this toxic culture times, there's parents have all this pressure. You know, they're afraid they're not being a good parent because of, you know, what you're maybe describing or something. And they will all normalize out. So I would be looking at what your eating practices are like as a family, you know, and... Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Hi, um, many of us in here are not registered dietitians, and many of us are working with individuals in various capacities. Um, for example, I, I teach in the School of Hypels, and so uh, personal trainers, coaches, mm. PE teachers, health teachers, and I'm wondering sort of what is the, the balance of inserting intuitive eating principles into these professional ways without being a registered dietitian? Oh, I love the question. Oh my God, thank you for the respect of the boundaries of the profession. You know what, Elise and I actually read, uh, wrestled with that question. I've got a great answer for you. I think it is. We were getting this kind of question, and we started thinking, you know, we need to start certifying people. And I will be honest, I, when we were having this conversation, I was saying to Elise, well, I think we just should do dietitians, because I'm familiar with that. And she was there, Evelyn, if you look at just the, the weight loss industry, and they have people with no degrees, no professions, the more we can get all professions elevated into this concept, the better we serve people. And so that's what we do. We certify any allied health professional from trainers, you know, because they're getting the same message. So they all apply. So I, I guess what I would answer in that is the issue of maybe boundaries and scope of practice. And that is maybe once you're getting into a medical problem or a eating disorder or something like that, then there, there's going to take some more work on that. But as a general premise, wouldn't it be wonderful if that's how our kids were taught to eat in school? You know what I mean? All of that. So I'm glad you're introducing it. In fact, I'll tell you a, a, a short story. I have a, a, a trainer that took one of my trainings, physical trainer, and she said, you know, I want to introduce it to my gym. And so she decided to train the trainers first, and she was so nervous because, you know, they're, they're all about cutting calories and looking cut. And she was blown away by what she received. She got such a turnout and such relief because these trainers were suffering actually more than the clients because they had these expectations of what they should be like. And so it gave them this new level of freedom, something else to be working with. So imagine now, uh, in fact, the, the, the health professionals I refer to are ones who use this practice. You know, uh, when I refer to an exercise physiologist, it's someone who is teaching them to connect to their body so they can hear an injury or what does feel good, what is fun in your body and those kinds of things. So, Good for you. I'm thrilled you're doing that. Keep going, okay? <laughs> um, with regards to what types of food you're eating rather than the quantity, yeah. uh, when you get a specific craving for something like, you know, bananas or pickles and ice cream or whatever, is that your body telling you that you need to eat those things or is that just what happens to sound good? That is such a good question. And I will tell you, um, I wish the answer was, oh, yes, because your body needs that exact banana. When you actually look at a lot of the nutrient deficiencies, one of the symptoms are no appetite at all, you know? And yet, at the same time, I, there, I think there's something to a craving as well, so I would, I would go with it, but I wouldn't assume that you're automatically taking care of all your nutrient needs by, by doing that. One of my favorite story examples was out of Boston. Um, women who had really bad morning sickness, they had to be hospitalized, so they're vomiting all the time. And here's what they found out. If they put them on a healthy diet, these women would develop aversion to broccoli and all these things because they're constantly getting sick. If instead they let them eat what they wanted and it was like potato chips and pickles, they actually ended up eating a healthier diet overall because they didn't develop the aversions and they eventually got back to what they needed to do. So there's something to it, but it's not so fine-tuned that, yeah, you got your iron in there, you got your chromium in there, and you know, so. Thank you. You're welcome. That kind of leads into my question or Beautiful. answers it a little bit, but um, I kind of work in the food world and talk about food a lot, and I'm kind of challenging the idea of like intuitive eating or questioning it. Like, if you know, biologically, back when we were trying to find food out in the forest foraging, we knew we wanted fat because that could give us, you know, some nutrients for a longer time, and sugar meant it was good, not poisonous. And so, you know, obviously fast food people have figured this out, so let's pack everything with sugar and mm. fat because likely biologically, they're gonna love it. And so, I mean, I get what you're saying and I, I eat a lot of butter and bacon and I like sugar and, 
And yet I also recognize like, well, of course I want Oreo. Like, no kidding, like that's, that's what my body used to need to get in order to survive. So how do you, I mean, do you ever suggest to people that, yeah, obviously all that food is going to taste really good, but yeah. maybe you just say, I know it's supposed to taste good and maybe I'll just avoid it for this time, but I know that's getting into this like, Oh, no, Eat what your body wants. But. This is, you're asking a really good question. I'm really glad you're asking it. And so it's, it's the conundrum of our times as well because there is a lot of marketing. There's a lot of ingredient fixing and all that, that kind of stuff. So I'm going to share a story. First of all, e eating healthy actually feels good. People forget about that because there's, there's so much like, oh, you got to really buck it up to eat healthy. It's like, actually, no, it feels good. I keep talking about my son. And this is a good story because this is actually a time where we were not getting along. It was a tough time. Oh, my God. He knew it all. He was 16, 15, whatever he was. So he had spent the day at an amusement park, came running home. He always busts through the door, I don't know why. And here's what he said to me. Mom, I ate a bunch of junk all day. I want to eat something extra healthy for dinner. Will you make me something extra healthy? And the reason I'm telling you this, he was not trying to score points with me. Far from it. But this is a kid who knows what it feels like. So he ate, I forget what, I don't even remember what he ate, but he knows what that feels like. And so if you were eating Orioles all day or something, it, it it wouldn't taste good. I mean, it wouldn't feel that body congruence part, which I didn't talk much about, that's what that has to do with. And so the problem is when there's so many rules about what I should do, what I shouldn't do, you're not getting, you know, connected to that. You know, the other thing I tell my patients when they're ready is like if you're new, if you're indifferent about eating something, well then of course especially eat something healthy. You know, if you don't care if it's an Oreo or an apple, well, for goodness sakes, eat the apple, okay? But the work I do with so many people, there's so much guilt involved with this, and they're so disconnected from their body, I tend to spend a lot more time on that. So there's value in what you're saying. I think there's value to the idea of this whole foods message. I'm just careful how I do it, because people are coming in to see me with all these rules to begin with. And if I start with that so soon, it's like I don't tell them when I was eating you know, raspberry sauce and tofu blintzes for breakfast, because all that got, and I love it, but that would just reinforce my stuff, not, not helping them get, get connected. So yes, we do want them to get into all this healthy eating, but it's unpacking some of this stuff as well. But there's a lot of advertising, and you know, I, I spent some time talking about the beauty industry and the weight loss industry, but the truth is, yeah, food marketing does all kinds of stuff. So there's something there to that, absolutely. D did I answer your question? Okay. Um, within the last, I would say, two weeks, I switched my position to work in school food service for menu planning. Um, and I find it very frightful um, to try to fit their requirements, USDA requirements, with, within the calorie ranges. They get dessert, you know, they can have it once a week or they can have it once a month. So when you serve it, every kid will eat because you served a Rice Krispie bar that day. Um, and I feel like it really limits their choice and it really limits... Um, them getting into that intuitive eating um, in terms of offering them a wide array of things other than saying this is what you're getting because USDA tells me that I need to put it on your plate. Um, and that sounds kind of bad maybe, but um, it's just been a lot of hype lately in terms of the regulations and I think parents really can see that as well. Do you have any thoughts on what several, has come out? I figured thoughts. you might. Okay. <laughs> I didn't talk about this. I I wrote another book called Healthy Eating in School with two psychologists. One was Tracy Tilke, who's done a lot of research on intuitive eating. The other one's Catherine Cook Cotton. And it was a, this concept about how do we have a healthy school environment? How do we prevent obesity and eating disorders? And all of this of what you're talking about. So we, oh, this, was, this was by the APA, American Psychological Association, published it. So we had to dot every I and, oh my God, I was going to die sometimes. I was like, no. <laughs> um, but here's what's really cool. When a school has a standard that's applying to everyone, that's a very different message than a mom or a, or a dad saying, you can't eat this, you can't eat that. So for example, policies around vending machines, if you have limits on those, that does not interfere with intuitive eating. It does not trigger forbidden food syndrome. Okay, there's been actually some research on that. Um, and you're serving, I'm assuming, just one or maybe two meals a day if you're doing the, the breakfast thing. So it's, it's not the only time. And this is allowing the child to eat according to hunger and fullness. And what I would love to see is have kids having more time to eat their meals, you know. Maybe have them play first and then eat, because that to me is what really 
fosters those kinds of things. And then lastly, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Dale Hayes. She's out of Montana. She's a dietitian, and all she does now is stuff with schools. Her tweet thing is school meals rock. She's an intuitive eater, school food person, and you can see me afterwards if you need contact information because she's amazing, and she'll give you great ideas. So she gets it. Before I ask my question, I'll tell you that, um, and I'm not here representing them, but I've worked for Weight Watchers for 20 years. And I don't think anyone that I know from Weight Watchers would have any issue with anything that you said. However, I do think it makes sense about the points and, you know, it still has restrictions to it. So I get that. But as far as all the basic principles of intuitive eating, I, you know, I don't think it's any different from what, at least in my class, I teach at Weight Watchers. However, Weight Watchers is an international multi-billion dollar company and I don't know what everyone else is doing in there, you know. Yeah. So besides that, but my other question is about, I have two daughters and one of them is really likes food and, you know, loves food and seems to be a really good intuitive eater. She's got a little weight problem now due to some other health problems. The younger one doesn't have any like emotional relationship to food at all. Mm. Can you ever go too far? And she's thin. So I'm like, maybe that's the way to be, you know, but if we told her, all you're going to have for the rest of your life is cereal, and it's these two kinds. She, she'd be like, okay. Yeah. You know? Is so, like, are there people, like, to me, that's not right either. That's terrifying. She doesn't seem to have a great enjoyment of food I've ever. I've actually met people you know what I mean? like that. I've, I've, I've actually worked with, I've had, actually, you know what, not in my practice, because I don't have the problems with, with the eating. Um, there's different levels of joy. There's the robust Julia Child French level of joy. There's a reverence and art to living and eating kind of thing. And then there's just the other side of the spectrum where it's very mechanical and it's food and yeah, this tastes good, I'm fine, and they move on to the next thing. There's nothing wrong with that either, as long as they're connected, you know, with, with hunger, fullness, and, and that kind of stuff. It, it's the deprivation and the rigid rules that, that gets to be the problem, you know? And you know, one thing I haven't addressed, I'm not going to, but of course we're looking at different medical issues. I, I was working with a kid with autism, and that was a very different experience. And in this case, he needed things more concrete, more black and white, but we still had these discussions of connection in terms of what tasted good and how he wanted to do certain kinds of things. So, yeah. Just a little background before I ask my question. Yeah. I have a broad scheme of family members and friends with different uh, weight issues so you go from very heavy to very skinny mm. and also I don't have any kids and don't plan for it in the near future just to put it out there <laughs> <laughs> but with that said um, when going and raising a child in a gluten-free and oh. a whole food manner do you think that would backfire with the standard American diet going on if you're raising them in your house with gluten-free and whole foods do you think they're going to go out and seek McDonald's and junk food in it, another it, it, way? It, it, like it all depends. You don't have it in your household. Are they going to go out and search for it and binge outside? It depends how you set that up. Okay, so it's like this. Um, if it's one thing to have the standard in your household, but if it's rigid and they know it, and the only time they're going to go get, and I'm assuming when you say no gluten, it's not because they have celiac disease, it's just a preference? Is that Correct. I mean, okay. I've, I've toyed with that before, and I, I do know that if I don't have gluten in my, my dinner, my lunch, or whatever, I have more energy and I feel better after okay. I don't have that groggy feeling, where if I put that into the child, are they going to notice that, or are they going to go and see an Oreo or something? I, like I think as long as they can be still socially connected. So I'm going to give you some of my examples. And I've, seen, I've worked with families where there's problems like this, and other times where no, it's not, because it, I had a parent describe it as, it's like Europe, and my house is Switzerland, and that's, you know, Whole Foods and what you're describing maybe. But when they go to France, or when they go to the other families' houses, they're okay, whatever is being served. But if this kid, when they go to someone else's house and there's not a medical condition and they're not allowed to eat the sugar there and not allowed to eat that, I will tell you that is the kid who's going in and, and getting the candy bars out of, you know, their friends' drawers and all of that stuff. So it just has to do with how, number one, if you have the connection still going with the hunger fullness and that this is not a rigid thing outside of the household. So I'll give you an example. This is a weird, funny story. When my daughter... I didn't want to expose her to fast food, you know, and I will never forget, she was three when she uttered McDonald's. I'm like, where'd you hear that from? <laughs> <laughs> and my philosophy is this with little kids, they don't need to be eating that food, right? Um, and they're in your own, your own family. 
But I wasn't forbidding it. I knew when she would get older and social that those foods would be in her life, and they were. And the way I, I, I treated that is I didn't want my kids to be a conditioned consumer, and it would drive me nuts. Whenever the new movie was, that's the fast food place I wanted to go to get the toy. So sometimes we'd go and we'd buy just the hamburger and just the milk. Sometimes we'd go and buy just the toy, and they'd say, hey, you can get the whole meal with it. It's like, no, I didn't want them to be conditioned. And to this day, they're not big time into fast food, so I didn't make it an all or none kind of thing. It's a preference. I want a foundation of healthy eating, as in your household, you can do that. But we have to also, when it starts to intersect with real life, what happens, what happens there? Hi. Hi. Um, Intuitive eating doesn't seem to go hand in hand with calorie counting, and yet if you look at medical nutrition therapy books, uh, diet assessment is a must, or even choosemyplate.gov, so the food tracker, mm -hmm. you know, again, counting calories in and out. Do you see value in counting calories in any particular case? That's an excellent question, and I'm going to answer it in, in many ways. Um, when I'm working with someone with a medical condition, and in my case, eating disorders, I do assessments. I have patients who count calories who know calories like crazy. So what I do is I meet them where they're at. And so what I try and do is have them connect with their body. Well, gosh, when I do this assessment, your body, you know, you're eating down here, but your body needs up here. And so we start increasing their caloric incre increments. But I'm always asking the question, how does that feel in your body? And so when I'm working with weight gain with a person with eating disorder, I, here's what I say to them, is, you know, I would much rather your body tell me, tell us when to add the next amount of food. So if this week you can kind of pay attention to maybe where your body would feel the benefit, like points where you're feeling a little less energy, a little grumpy, a little less focused, or where you could eat more. So I try and have it have meaning. And the thing that, that gets me, there's this shift that ends up happening where I've got someone who's counting calories, they intend to restrict, then they wake up really, really hungry and they need to eat, and it ends up matching the calories that we set up or something. So it ends up reinforcing that. When I'm doing um, assessments with athletes, and here's other exceptions. So these are normal people, no eating, well, I see a lot of athletes with eating disorders, but even without. When you're doing a lot of intensive training, that will blunt your appetite for a couple hours. I'll never forget, I worked with a professional cyclist. He came in, he was tired all the time, and he thought he was lazy. Did the assessment, I went, dude, you're not getting any energy. <laughs> you know? He needed about 7,000 calories, he's eating about 2,000 calories. And so in that case, I didn't have him counting calories. I'm always looking at what is the most meaningful way to help the person get to where they need to be in life, whatever they're trying to do. And in this case, we did foods he was willing to add. And, and those kinds of things. So, yes, I think there can be some merit. I am concerned, though, however, with things like the my.gov for the general public. I think counting calories is a huge mistake. We've had calories since the Food Labeling Act, I think in the 19, 1980, and that has not, has not helped. And so I've seen it used more as a, a shaming thing. And so there's nothing wrong with, you know, calorie awareness, but to the point of, like, is this really going to change behavior, you know? That's what I would be looking at. So. You know, I, I realize I come up here and I'm on my little soapbox, but the truth is when I'm working with individuals, I'm always looking at what's going to be helpful for them, what's going to move them to the next, to the next place. So does that kind of help? Yeah. Okay. I think that's it. <laughs> well, I will stay here.